Northampton-based fiction writer Kelly Link's work has been called exquisite, cruelly wise, and the opposite of reassuring. She's been a Pulitzer Prize finalist, and now she can add MacArthur Fellow to her list of achievements. I asked Link her reaction to being one of this year's 25 MacArthur Genius Grant recipients. Uh, I think disbelief, which is, I am told, a very common one. Yeah. People, uh, when you receive, uh, I, not that I have ever had the honor, so I can't speak personally, but I imagine it's such a big, it's such a big award. Um, how did you learn of the, 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 the it would be named a grant winner? Um, they call you, and I think that has become more of an issue in the last couple of years because no most of us, lines. most of us don't answer our phones if you don't know the number. But it was a call coming from Chicago, and I have very fond associations with Chicago. So I thought, well, maybe this is an old friend and answered, and um, they told me the news. And so the process for being nominated for a MacArthur Fellow is anonymous, as I understand it. Yes. Do you have any idea who nominated you or how you got involved? No, I think the entire process is um, mysterious. And I totally understand why they would keep it that way, but it also means that when it happens to you, it has the feeling of a fairy godmother visit or something. It doesn't feel quite real. Um, so no, I know nothing about how the process works. Is it interesting or ironic for an author, author of magical realism to have this sort of mysticism and unknown <laughs> element to such a big uh, no uh, nomination for yourself? I think that the because that's the kind of stuff that I write and because I know that what I write is fictional that and by contrast what you actually feel is well this feels like fiction too this doesn't this this seems very very hard to to believe um, so you're allowed to tell one person I told my husband um, oh there's so there's a gap between when they tell you and when the public becomes yes, aware of it there's a gap of a month a month a month and I was very good I sat on that for a month in part because I thought well if if this isn't real then only my husband and I will sort of <laughs> the worst, <laughs> suffer through it. The worst prank call in history. Hi, pretty awesome, though. There was a certain point at which they send out a um, video crew to interview you. They send out a photographer. And at a certain point, I thought, well, this is a lot of work to put into a prank. Uh, <laughs> in which case, kudos. <laughs> so you and your husband got to keep the happy secret for a month. Yes. Now, this is your latest book here on the table, Get in Trouble. Yes. Um, magical realism, as I mentioned before, is kind of the phrase that's most often, I would say, connected to your work. Do you define it that way, or do you look at it as a different, in a different way? Do you know, I worked for many years in bookstores, and so I tend to think of books in terms of the categories that you shelve them in. So I began by writing mostly science fiction and fantasy, and that is probably where my books ended up most of the time, and I was fine with that. I think that in the last decade or so, there's been a real shift. You have many, many more people writing literary fiction who use genre conventions, and so now it's much more common to find books about the apocalypse or books about fairies or about vampires in mainstream fiction. Why do you think that they have become so hugely popular in the last maybe five, 10 years? I think that um, people who love to read, many of them read, if you read fiction, you're reading in part for, for pleasure. You're reading because books are a fun thing to uh, escape into. And uh, one of the best ways of escaping is to escape to situations which are so far away from the world that we live in that you can imagine things going well or going differently there. Mm. You mentioned that you worked in a bookstore previously. Did you one day come across this genre and think for yourself, oh, maybe I could give it a try? Or how did you come to be an author of, of this genre? I, this was just always the kind of books and short stories that I love to read. And so when I began writing, I began writing the kinds of stories that I had read as a kid that I loved. Hmm. So NPR, in an interview that you did with them, talking about Get in Trouble when it was first released, um, the latest short stories in that book are described as nighttime logic. Nighttime logic. Yeah. yeah. How, how, what does that mean? Uh, 
a little bit of a digression. Um, my husband and I run a very small press. Small beer press, Small right? beer press, yes. And one of the writers that we have been lucky enough to publish is a guy who lives in Texas, Howard Waldrop, who only writes short stories. Um, and he defines stories as proceeding according to daytime logic or nighttime logic. And daytime logic are you understand the rules of the story, you understand the world that the story is set in, and you feel as if you could be reading a story that's set in your own living room. Nothing is going to happen that's so extraordinary that it wouldn't happen in our world. And nighttime logic, nighttime logic stories are stories where you don't quite understand what's going to happen next. You don't really understand what's going on, and that's part of the pleasure of reading them. So they feel as if a little bit like a, the story is taking place in a kind of literary carnival, or in a fairy tale, or in a nightmare or a dream. So that fuzzy landscape, timescape that you experience when you're dreaming. You still kind of. feel that there's a logic there, that there's a reason for the things that are happening, that there are rules, but you inhabit the story in the same way that you inhabit a dream while you're asleep, in mm -hmm. which you think, all of this makes total sense. It and then you wake together. up. together. <laughs> you wake up and you think, none of that made sense. <laughs> and I, what I hope with short stories is that you exit the short story and you think, I don't understand why it made sense, but I, I you know, while I was there, it totally made sense to me. So I'll read it again. <laughs> I read that as a child, you really enjoyed the process of your parents reading yes. to you. And I noticed on your website that you actually read a few stories or make it available for people to click so that you oh, yeah. read the stories to them. Is that why you chose to do that? I think, so a bunch of the books that we publish, including one of my collections, is available as a free download online. And there are many, many links to stories that are either up on websites or that are... Um, or that are or that are different readers uh, perform, and I think part of that is because um, you know I didn't just work in bookstores. I'm also an enormous fan of libraries, and the idea that stories are accessible to people, not just um, you know if you buy them, but also you might want to try something and see if you actually like it. So the idea of having books up for free feels like a feels like a good idea. Mm. So it, over the course of your career, you've worked with big publishing houses, yeah. big publishers, but as you mentioned, you and your husband run a small press, yeah. small beer press. Were there things that you learned in the big publishing world that you thought, you know what, we could do things a little differently at this scale? Do you know, um, we, my, when we started the press, I had mostly published in science fiction and fantasy magazines. and. We had many friends who worked in four publishing houses in New York, and we got lots of valuable advice from them. But our model really was the small press model, which is that we can't afford to pay large advances, but we will make the experience for writers as rewarding as possible in terms of making sure they have input on cover design, making sure they're happy with the editorial process. Um, and I think the real advantage of the small press over working in a larger publishing house is you do get to be involved in every single step. I get to work on the covers of books that we publish. We get to work very closely with the writers that we publish. Um, and we really, really love the books that we publish. We're not doing this because it's lucrative, although we, we do um, make enough money to keep the press going. But we do it because we love the books and we want other people to find them. One of the ways that your work has been described is as, quote, the most darkly playful voice in American fiction. And I was thinking about the MacArthur Award, $625,000 grant. Does that money now afford you the opportunity to get a lot more playful? You know, I just got a letter from an old friend, and he said um, he wanted me to think of this as an opportunity to take as much time as I needed. I'm working on a novel now. And he said, the good news about this now is you can really just sit back, you can work on the novel, and really make sure that you are making the novel that you, you want to make, that it affords you a lot of time. And it does feel that way. We are also, my husband and I are also thinking about ways that we can use the money uh, for the press. 
um, but it, it does, it's an enormous financial relief to have somebody hand you a lot of cash.